Welcome to the second part of our summer introduction to paleontology sequence. Again, we're continuing our series of the process of paleontology, this time looking at field work. So for review from last time, the first step you have to do when doing paleontology is you have to find a site. So you have to get your lands permission. Remember, as with the case of Sue, if you don't have it, it causes massive problems further down the line. So once you have your permission, you can go prospecting, which, as you may remember, is different for different types of fossils. So these are three different quarries. Um, the one in the middle is a sauropod quarry. So there they would have booked for the ends of bones weathering out of the hill, or in some cases, such as this one, they may have found it as a construction site. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is a leaf quarry, so all those slabs of rocks are shale that have leaves in them. And the one on the right is a riverbank um, that has shark's teeth and other small fossils in it. So when you go out to the field, you have to make sure you have the proper tools. Um, the usual paleontologist toolkit consists of dental picks, um, which are wonderful tools for prying apart softer rocks, hand chisels and hammers, which are good for harder rocks or those tight places where nothing's loose to pull apart with the dental picks, brushes. The match in the field is that a clean quarry is a happy quarry, so you have to have several different sizes and types of brushes to be able to keep your fossils clean. Pneumatic tools. Um, in cases where there's much harder rock, sometimes you will take a portable air compressor out to the field and use pneumatics out there to help keep everything, or to help you get through the rocks better. And super glue. Sometimes you'll be going too fast and something will break. So you always want to make sure you have glue as well, because if you don't, you'll end up in a bad situation. You'll lose part of your bone. So, out in the quarry. This is a site up in the middle of Wyoming. Um, it's got a lovely canopy. This is actually a more luxurious site. Usually you're just on the side of a hill with nothing, but this quarry is lucky enough to have shade all day. Uh, the bottom picture is a panorama of the whole quarry, including the air compressor off in the far right corner. So working with the tools. Paleontological tools are pretty easy to get used to. Rock hammers, you simply take the flat end and break open slabs of rock, as is seen on the bottom picture. Uh, pneumatic tools, you use um, without applying lateral pressure or prying, just carefully let the tool do all the work and break through the rock, and then use chisels gently tapping on them to break off bits of the rock. Um, use brushes to keep everything nice and clean, and use dental picks when you need to pry. Measuring and mapping is another really important part of field work that's often not as much discussed. You have to record how the bones were in the field. That gives you a lot of information. For instance, say you find a dinosaur leg that's still in articulation. Not just association, not just the bones are near each other in more or less the right position, but actually articulated how you'd expect it to be in life. If you can't take that out as a three-ton solid cast, if that's not logistically possible, you'll have to separate that articulated leg, which means you have to have very, very good data about how that was in the ground. So we also want to number and catalog each bone before we remove it, because if you don't, um, you don't know exactly what you have, and it's a lot easier for bones to get lost. We use survey equipment and global positioning systems to get exact positions of the bones, um, which again just gives us another backup to make sure this is exactly where this bone was in articulation or association with these bones, so that we have a as good a shot as we can of rebuilding this once we bring it into the lab. And then we try to draw or photograph, or ideally both, every bone before we cast and remove it. Um, again, so we just have that more data. This is what this numbered bone was. This is the numbers it was associated with. This is what it is. You want as much data as you can. 
So once you've got your bone all prepped in the field, ready to be removed, you have to plaster jacket it. Occasionally we do this before the removal step, um, simply to protect things that are going to be in the ground for a while, but usually we plaster right before we remove. So in the picture in the upper left, they're in process of plastering a tibia fibula um, in articulation of a sauropod. Um, we use um, hydrocal plaster usually, as well as burlap strips to create these jackets, which are really, really strong. Occasionally with the large ones, we'll use wood or rebar as extra support. And every once in a while, if you've got the right equipment, you make giant casts such as the one on the bottom right um, that can be airlifted out. But if you are up on a hill and that's not an option, usually the casts are smaller, um, somewhere between as small as a couple pounds to up to maybe two or three hundred pounds is the largest they'll get um, so that they can be removed by a couple big strong guys. Um, that's just another silly picture of plastering gone a little bit silly. Because um, field work is fun. Every once in a while you get to just goof around. So once everything's plastered, um, Paleontologists try to pedestal or mushroom the bones. This gives it as best a chance as possible of making sure, A, there are no other bones underneath that we're going to break when we remove it, and B, creates a very thin support that's easy to break through so that we can flip it and roll it again without damaging anything around it. Um, so the picture on the left, upper left, is of a bone right before we prepped it, pulled it out and you can see the pedestal channel going all the way around it. Every place with tin foil is another bone, so you have to be really, really careful to lift straight out and without hitting those other bones. And then the other two pictures, the one on the upper right, is that same cast flipped and pulled out of the ground, and then the hole where it had been. So a few things to remember in the field. You want to stay hydrated. Um, there have been times I've been working out in the field and it's gotten up to 140 degrees with the sun glare off the rocks. So if you do not drink water, you will pass out or you will get sunstroke and you will have to go to the hospital. And often when you're five miles from the road and then another 20 from the nearest town, it's going to be a very dangerous situation for you and for the rest of your crew. So drink lots of water, eat lots of food, keep yourself in as good a physical condition as you can. Um, another thing along with that is wear sunscreen. You don't want to be coming out of there with a severe sunburn or sun poisoning in the most extreme cases either. Um, that will make it extremely difficult for you to work, will make it unpleasant for your team, and again, you're far from any amenities out in the field usually. So wear the sunscreen, drink the water. Also keep an eye out, beware of animals. Some, like the little mouse on the left, is nice and cute and won't hurt you. Others, like the scorpion, not so much. Um, I've also seen deer, lizards, um, a copperhead snake at one point, rattlesnakes, there's lots of animals out in the field. You're out in their territory, so be respectful of them, but be careful of where you're working, because the last thing you'd want to do is get bit by a snake or stung by a scorpion or something along those lines, again, because you're out in the field. Um, some of the best advice I've ever heard is to take breaks, especially during the hottest part of the day. Um, especially during the summer in Wyoming, when I've gone out on digs with various groups. Um, we will work from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., and then we won't work at all between 11 and 3. And that's because that's when it gets the hottest. That's usually when there's no shade on the hill, and that's when it's the most dangerous to be out there. That's when you're at the highest risk for dehydration, sunstroke, any of those sorts of things. So take a long lunch break. Um, usually the sun doesn't set until 9 or 10 o'clock while you're out in the field during the summer. So you'll have plenty of time to work while the day is cooler. And then one of the last big things to remember is that you don't have to rush. Don't 
risk yourself or the bones or anyone around you by trying to get stuff out too fast. Everything's been in the rocks for hun tens to hundreds of millions of years. How fast you pull it out doesn't matter as much as your safety. And then the last thing to remember is that at the end of the day, you've done some good work and had some fun. Field work is one of my favorite parts of doing paleontology. Um, be proud of the work you do, because it helps science. It's very rewarding to yourself. There's no feeling more wonderful than seeing that hole where something you've been working on for several weeks is now no longer in the ground. Discovery is fine and all, but taking things out is what's really sweet. So be proud of the work you do out in the field. It's good work. So as usual, have some links for further information if you want to learn more how fields work works. Um, so I'll put these down in the doobly-doo, and you can explore those as you please. So next in our sequence will be lab work. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or leave them in the comments. And thank you for watching.